you, but to me, there's something about being told that a, a certain task, that something is impossible. There's something inside of me that wants to prove what somebody calls impossible, possible. Anybody else feel the exact same way? Uh, when I was in fourth grade, you know, fourth grades that time where, where boys are trying to prove their manliness and trying to prove that they're stronger and better than everyone else. Well, there was a boy that came into our fourth grade classroom and, and he started bragging in front of the rest of the class that he had unbreakable crayons. I'm not sure if I've ever told this story before, but, but, but he, I mean, he was just bragging about it. Nobody can break these crayons. These crayons are unbreakable. Nobody can break these crayons. Well, to me, that was a challenge. And there in the back of the classroom, you know, he's bragging, and I looked at him and I said, I can break those crayons. And he said, no, you can't. He showed me the box. Unbreakable crayons. I said, I can break one. And so while we were supposed to be doing our schoolwork, teachers sitting at her desk, I asked him for one of those crayons, and he gave me one of those crayons, and I reared back, and as hard as I could, I threw that crayon on the ground. Let me tell you today, I broke the crayon, all right? I proved the impossible possible, but to my detriment, that crayon hit the ground, bounced up in the air, and landed right on the teacher's lap. And so even though I proved the impossible, I got in trouble that day. And I learned that it's not my job to necessarily prove that which is supposedly impossible. And the passage that we are looking at today, it's a unique passage. It's unique because what God accomplishes in the body of Maria is so, or Mary, is so unthinkable, so humanly impossible that it is beyond the realm of our comprehension. And it proves to us that God is able to accomplish the incredible. God is able to accomplish the impossible. Let me ask you this morning, where are you in your life? What is the need that you have in your life? I, I love the words of the song that Cleeton sang today because it doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what your need is, whether that need is a physical need, whether that need is a, is a financial need, whether that need is a relational need, whether that need is an emotional need. It does not matter what that need is and it does not matter how impossible that need might seem to you. The answer is the same for each and every one of us. The answer is Jesus. Because with Jesus, there is no such thing as an impossibility. And we see that truth exemplified in today's passage. So if you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading in verse 26. You follow along. We'll put it up on the screen. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. You can follow along in whatever translation that you have. Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, let me pause there. Remember last week we talked about Zechariah and Elizabeth and the angel coming and, and promising that even though Zechariah and Elizabeth were in their old age, probably in their 80s, that she would become pregnant and they would give birth to a son. Well now, some six months have passed. And so in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel once again, sends the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and says, greetings, favored woman. If you underline in your Bible, that's a great phrase to underline. Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. We'll talk about what that phrase means in just a moment. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You might want to underline that phrase as well. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, 
a question that all of us would ask. But how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but now she's in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Would you read that verse with me? Verse 37, let's read it together. For nothing is impossible with God. That was about a third of you. Can we all read it together today? For nothing is impossible with God. Verse 38, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Would you pray with me today? Lord, thank you so much for the privilege that we have to meet together and to look at your word. And Lord, uh, we trust that Jesus has already been honored and glorified in this service. Lord, Lord, not only have we placed big letters on our platform with the name Jesus, and not only are we focusing attention on, on that name, but we're focusing attention on you. You... You promised to be with us. As a matter of fact, you've told us that wherever there's, there's a small group of people that are meeting together in your name, that you are there with them. So Father, we, we trust and we believe and we sense your presence today. I pray that you'd minister to each and every one of us in a very special way. God, minister to us today at our point of need. Give us exactly what we need. Help us not only to understand the truth of this passage, but give us exactly what we need in our lives. Encourage the discouraged. Lord, I pray that you would give strength to the disheartened. And Lord, those that are struggling with their faith, we pray this morning that their faith would be strengthened because we realize that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Lord, as we begin this Christmas season, help us to realize that with you, there is absolutely nothing that is impossible. And we promise to give you all the praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let me take a few minutes and put today's text within its context. We're in uh, our third message of our series in the book of Luke called Investigating Jesus. And I would remind you that Luke is writing this book to a man named Theophilus or Theophilus. Theophilus, uh, the recipient of this book, is, is receiving this. And Luke, the purpose of Luke's writing is to convince Theophilus as to the veracity, the life, and the miracles and the accomplishments of Jesus. And so as we read through this book, keep in mind what Luke is trying to accomplish. As we begin this chapter, Luke takes Theophilus back to the very beginning of Jesus' life. Not all of the gospel writers do that. Mark actually begins Jesus' life as an adult, but Luke begins in the very beginning so that Theophilus and us can understand everything. Luke describes both the births of John the Baptist and of, uh, and of Jesus in more detail than any other gospel. As a matter of fact, as great as the story was of, the office of uh, John the Baptist last week, I'm sorry, Luke shows that Jesus is far superior than John the Baptist. And even John the Baptist recognizes that because later on, John the Baptist will say, man, you know what? I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. It's not about John the Baptist. It's about Jesus. And so in today's passage, Luke relates to the circumstances of Mary becoming pregnant. As we mentioned a few weeks ago, the, the detail that Luke shows leads most to believe that these events were told to him by no one other than Mary herself. Many believe that Luke sat down and had a conversation. He interviewed Mary, and Mary shared with him the, the details, why the intimate details of Gabriel's arrival, Gabriel's message, and of her pregnancy as well. 
So notice several interesting things about this passage as we walk through these verses today. Notice the first thing that I wrote down is this. God's selection, he chooses the improbable. As we mentioned last week in God's selection of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the people that God chooses are vastly different than the people, than the ones that you and I would choose. Instead of going to the aristocratic, instead of going to the refined or the elites, he often selects the ordinary. He often selects the unexpected. That is certainly seen in the selection of the woman that would bear his son. Notice Luke tells us several interesting facts about Mary. First of all, he says that Mary was from Nazareth. Notice in verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. Now remember, in the first story, the first time that Gabriel arrived, Gabriel went to Jerusalem, which was Israel's economic, political, political and spiritual hub, and he sent him there to select John the Baptist, but now he heads in the other direction. Instead of going to Jerusalem, this big city, he sends him out into the countryside. He sends him out to a remote village called Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was a small village of some 1,500 people. It's interesting that Luke even gives precise detail. Notice once again, he gives specifics. He says he sends Gabriel to Nazareth, and then he puts in parentheses, a village in Galilee. Now, Why would he be that specific? He was that specific because possibly Theophilus and many of the individuals that would read this gospel account might not have been familiar with Nazareth. They might have sat back and said, okay, Nazareth, I'm not sure, where is that town? Let me give you an example, and some of you might know, but I'd venture to say most of you don't. How many know where Chocolosky, Florida is? Okay, boy, there's more than I thought. Maybe not a really good example, all right? The most of us don't know where Chocolosky, Florida is. And so if I mentioned today Chocolosky, Florida, I would have to give specifics. I would have to show you where it is. Well, I have a map. Here's Chocolosky, Florida. Can you put it up? It's on the west coast west of Big Cyprus on the other side of the Everglades. So when I talk about that little town, I need to give you specifics where that town is. Better example, how many of you here today know where Waynesburg, Ohio is? All right, we have Three or four people from Ohio who know where Waynesburg, Ohio is. You say, Brian, what in the world is Waynesburg, Ohio? That is the metropolis where Vicki was born, this huge city. And so in order to tell you where Waynesburg, Ohio is, i got to give you more specifics. It's in Stark County. It's south of Canton. That's what Luke is doing. Because Nazareth was a small, insignificant village. He says that the angel Gabriel went to Nazareth, which was a small town in Galilee. Several years I had the privilege of of touring Israel, and we went to Nazareth, which now is a large city of some 100,000 people. But during the time of Joseph and Mary, it was just a small village, and you could walk around what were the remains of this village in just a few short minutes. What's the idea? Nazareth was an insignificant town. Here's a verse that demonstrates what I'm talking about. In Matthew chapter 2, in verse 23, Matthew says this, So the family went and lived in a town called, called Nazareth. This fulfilled what the prophet said, speaking of Jesus. He would be called a Nazarene. Many believe that the tag Nazarene was a synonym for contemptible, since Nazareth was such an unlikely place to be the residence of the Messiah. So the place where Mary was from shows that her selection was improbable. Notice the second thing that the angel says about Mary. He says very clearly, Mary was a virgin. Notice verse 27, he says, to a virgin named Mary. Now, Now let's just be honest today. Some I would say many are trying to explain away the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. 
Many today are trying to deny the, the veracity, the authenticity of the fact that, that, that Mary gave birth to Jesus having never known a man. And they take this word and try to dissect this word and say, well, the word doesn't really mean a virgin. And so, you know, we can't really pin it down and say that Mary was a virgin before she uh, gave birth to Jesus. That's just simply not true. The Greek word that's used in the passage is the word parthenos. It's a term that means several things, and I've put them in your notes. It's a term that means more than just a young woman. Now, in the New Living Translation, it says, it gives both concepts. It says, a young woman, a young virgin. The term here means chaste. It means a marriageable young woman. In biblical times, for a young woman to be marriageable, she had to be able to demonstrate the evidences of her virginity. That's a topic for a different day, but the text is clear. Mary was not just a young woman, even though she was uh, a young lady of some 14 or 15 years old. She was not just a young woman, but she was a virgin. The term also means sexually pure. You say, Brian, how do you jump at that conclusion? Well, Mary herself in the passage reiterates that truth. Notice in verse 34 how Mary continues her conversation with the angel. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. Some would argue, well, see, that doesn't prove anything. Mary is simply saying, hey, how can this happen? I also am a young woman. But that's not what Mary says in the passage. The actual literal, literalness of the passage, Mary says this, how can this happen because I have never known a man? Mary herself gives authenticity to the fact that she was sexually pure. She says, I have never been with a man. Now let me pause here. And I know all of us are experiencing just a little bit of a turkey hangover today. All right? And um, if you're like me, you've, you've eaten turkey and slept and eaten turkey and slept. I hope you didn't have turkey for breakfast because I want you to put on your thinking caps today. All right? The virgin birth of Jesus Christ is so very important to what we believe. And this is a doctrine that we cannot, this is a doctrine that we must not let slip away. And we must not allow liberal scholars to water down what God says in his word. You might say, Brian, how come you're making such a big deal out of this? Because the Bible makes a big deal out of this. And let me give you three very important truths that demonstrate why the virgin birth is so very important. First of all, the virgin birth is necessary for the inspiration and the inerrancy of Scripture. The word inerrancy simply means this, that the Bible is without error. You see, if Mary, just suppose with me for a moment today, as some would have us assume, that that Mary was a young lady that had not been sexually pure, that, that Mary had had physical relations before, either with Joseph, her fiancé, or maybe with someone else. And so God comes to this already expectant mother and says, okay, I'm going to allow you to be the bearer of my son. What would that do to everything that we believe? First of all, that would disprove the veracity of Scripture because the Bible clearly says that Mary had never known a man before. And so if we cannot believe Luke chapter 1, what makes us think that we could believe any other passage of Scripture? And so to deny the virgin birth of Mary negates the authenticity of the inerrancy of God's Word. It's very important. It's necessary for the deity of Jesus. You see, if Joseph, Joseph was Jesus' biological father, then how could Jesus be divine? How could Jesus be God himself? It would deny the deity of Christ. And it was also, or the virgin birth is also necessary for the sinlessness 
of Jesus Christ. You see, if Joseph was his biological father, if Mary received that seed from Joseph and not by some uh, divine work of the Holy Spirit of God, then Jesus would have received a sinful nature just as you and I received. But that's not the case. The text says very clearly that when the angel came to Mary, Mary was a virgin. Mark Driscoll in his book, The Supremacy of Christ in a Postmodern World, says this. I'll put it up on the screen if you can follow along. He says, if the virgin birth of Jesus is untrue, then the story of Jesus changes greatly. We would have a sexually promiscuous young woman lying about God's miraculous hand in the birth of her son, raising that son to declare he was God and then joining his religion. But if Mary is nothing more than a sinful con artist, then neither she nor her son Jesus should be trusted. Because both the clear teachings of Scripture about the beginning of Jesus' early life and the character of his mother are at stake. We must contend for the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Church, let me uh, me challenge you. Don't allow anybody to cause you to begin to doubt what God's Word says says the bible says very clearly that mary was a virgin as we continue with an outline the next thing that he says about mary is this mary was engaged to be married now engagement in new testament times was different than it is today the betrothal or engagement period usually lasted about a year during that time the husband would get his house built but generally adding Uh, In addition, usually they wouldn't go out and build their own place. They would just add an addition on to their parents' home. And although the couple did not live together, the engagement was a legally binding relationship that could only be terminated by divorce. In other words, when a couple were engaged in New Testament times, they were committed to each other before they ever came together. Let me just pause for a second, and I know I might step on some toes, and if I do, uh, I'm not going to apologize, but in our day and age, we invert that. Many live together before they make a commitment, and in New Testament times, they made a commitment before they ever lived together. That's what we find taking place here in the passage. Mary was engaged to be married and she was engaged to a man named Joseph and the only thing that Luke says about Joseph is he describes him as a descendant of David let me show you a fourth thing about Mary this is significant the fourth thing that he says about Mary is this Mary was highly favored I want you to see this in the passage notice verse 28 notice what he says the angel comes and says uh, Gabriel appeared to her and says greetings favored woman The Lord is with you. Jump over to verse 30. In verse 30, he says, Don't be afraid, Mary. The angel told her, For you have found favor with God. The term that Gabriel uses for favor is the Greek word charis. It's the word from which we get our word grace. It it means unmerited favor. Receiving something that you do not deserve. Now think with me today, how does that apply to this passage? I gave two explanations in your notes. The first is this. Her selection was based on grace and not on any personal merits. Let me say that again. That's so significant. Mary's selection was based on grace and not on any personal merits. Merit. Mary was not sinless. She was, a, she was a wonderful, godly young girl, but she was not sinless. And as we'll see in next week's passage in her, in her great song, she even recognized the fact that she needed a Savior. The only way that she could ever be selected for this huge honor was not because of anything that she had done, but only of the grace of God would be demonstrated on her life. The angel says, God's grace is given to you. Let me make a second point because this is so significant. Her selection demonstrated that she was the recipient of God's grace and not the giver of God's grace. 
That's important because certain religions today characterize Mary as the dispenser of grace. But here in the passage, she's not characterized as the dispenser of grace. She's characterized as the recipient of grace. God chose her not because of her perfection. God simply chose her because of grace. Let me pause for a second and say this. That encourages me. I trust that it encourages you. That should encourage us with the fact that each and every one of us can be used of God. Obviously not in the exact same way. But we can be used of God. Why? Because God's grace, God's favor has been extended to us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. Everything that we have, everything that we receive from God is a demonstration of God's favor, God's grace upon our lives. He uses us in different capacities and in different ways, but his selection of you and his selection of me is based on grace and not on our worthiness. Is there anyone here today that could say, I deserve salvation? Is there anybody here today that could say, I deserve to be used of God? Is there anybody here today that could say, I'm worthy? There's not a single one of us. We are what we are. We have what we have solely by the grace of God. And as God looked for a young lady that he would use as as that vessel that would produce his son, the text clearly says that he demonstrated grace on Mary. Her selection was completely improbable. Let me show you a second thing as we walk through the passage. We not only see Mary's selection, but we see Gabriel's declaration. In verses 34 through 37, he explains the impossible. Let let me just walk through it. First of all, he gives a detailed description of Mary's son. And he actually says five things about this coming son. The first thing that he says is this. He says, Mary, you will name him Jesus. Now, now this is significant. I really haven't had a lot of time to think about it and wrap my mind around it, but, but I would have thought that when God sent his son into the world, he would have come up with a, a brand new name. I mean, he would have come up with his name that is so awesome, that is so spectacular, you know, something like, and you shall name him supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, or, or, or something along those lines. That's not what he says. The angel says, and you shall name him Jesus. Well, that's a name that we used before. That, that's a name that, that reaches all the way back to the time of Joshua in the Old Testament. It it was a common name that represented a parent's praise for God's continued work in the life of the family and in the life of a nation. You say, Brian, what does Jesus mean? It means this, the Lord is salvation is what the name means. And even though it had been used many times before, Maybe for the very first time, the name, the meaning of the name Jesus comes into its significance. And now it takes on special significance. He will be Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. He says the second thing. It says he will be great. I read that. I thought, man, you talk about an understatement. In all of Scripture, his name will be great great. If you took all of the greatest thinkers of every country and of every century and of the world and put them in a room with Jesus, they would shut their mouths as they listen to the greatness of his wisdom. All the greatest generals would listen to Jesus' strategy. All the greatest musicians would listen to the music theory and Jesus' performance on every instrument. There is nothing that Jesus cannot do that is not a thousand times better than anyone else can do. Words, Words fail to demonstrate the greatness of Jesus. So Gabriel leaves it. 
very simple and very profound. He will be great. It says a third thing. He will be called the Son of the Most High. It's interesting, he uses the Old Testament name for Jesus, El Elyon, the Son of the Most High, which is used repeatedly throughout the Old Testament as the name for God. Here's the meaning, the meaning being that Jesus is uniquely God's Son, the divine Word, the image of God, begotten from all of eternity, and that God of the Old Testament is producing a Son that will be none other than Jesus Christ. And not only will he fulfill everything that's going to happen in the future, but he fulfills all of those Old Testament prophecies as well. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. He will sit on David's throne. It's fitting and inevitable that he will be king. He will fulfill the prophecies that a son of David would rule over Israel, but not over Israel. You see that little baby, the prophecy about Mary's baby. Here's what Gabriel is saying. Mary, your son will rule the world. And then he makes one final statement. And his kingdom will never end. His kingdom will never end. Now think with me. Do you see what that promise means? It means that Jesus is alive and ruling today at 11 o'clock on December 1st, 2013. Jesus is alive, and Jesus is ruling and reigning. You see, Jesus, Savior, Son of God, King of the world, is governing just as realistically as President Obama is governing or leading our country today. Here's the question. Are you recognizing his reign in your life? Am I recognizing his reign in my life? You see, he is Lord of lords. He is King of kings. But do I recognize him as the Lord of my life? Do I recognize him as the King of my life? It's one thing for him to be Lord universally. It's another thing for him to be recognized as Lord in my life and your life as well. The the angel gives a detailed description of Mary's son. He gives a second thing. He gives a detailed description of Mary's conception. In verses 34 and 35, let me read them again. Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. And the angel, in a very simple and profound way, describes. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy. And he will be called the Son of God. You said, Brian, what is it exactly that the angel is saying? Well, I divided it into three sections. Let me mention them quickly. The first is this. He says the process of the conception was a divine work of the Holy Spirit. The process was a divine work of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're like me, our curiosity wants to know the specifics. Okay, Brian, I get that. But how? How did it happen? The biblical record is concise and tells us everything that we need to know. Here's the specifics. You want to catch this? Jesus was conceived by a creative act of the Holy Spirit of God in the womb of Mary. That's simple. Jesus was conceived By a creative act of the Holy Spirit of God in the womb of Mary. The the word that's used here is a very interesting word. Notice in verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Let me just clarify something. That's not a term that is used in reference to sexual relations. God is not saying, okay, Mary, here's what's going to happen. The Holy Spirit of God is going to come, and the Holy Spirit of God is going to have intimate relations with you. That is not what the text means. The word overshadowed here is used four or five times in the New Testament. 
It's always used except for one time in the New Testament. It's always used as a reference to a divine act of God. As a matter of fact, 80% of the time this word is used, it's we're used in reference to two miraculous events. It's used in reference to the virgin birth of, birth of Jesus, and the other time it's used, it's used in reference to the transfiguration of Jesus. When Jesus is there on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he's transfigured there in front of the disciples, the word that is used is the word overshadowed. What does it talk about? talks about a mysterious act of God where God comes in and God performs the supernatural. God accomplishes something that we cannot wrap our minds and our hearts necessarily around, but God accomplishes a supernatural task. And see, the process of the conception very simply is this. It was a divine work of the Holy Spirit of God. He mentions the second thing. Notice the product of the conception was that Jesus would be holy and the Son of God. Notice verse 35. Once again, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. So, that word so, you might want to circle it. That word so could also be translated therefore. That's a purpose clause. And so here's what the angel's saying. This is what the Holy Spirit of God is going to do. And the result of that, the purpose of that, the result of all of that is that this baby that will come out from your womb will be holy and will be the Son of God. He mentions a third thing, the problem of the conception was resolved by God's ability to do the impossible. You see, we sit back and say, hold on, Brian, time out. Biologically, that makes no sense. Brian, time out. Medically, that makes no sense whatsoever. How could that happen? There's a problem there in the text. Well, the problem is resolved by God's ability to do the impossible. And if you notice in the text, he gives a, a, an example and he gives a declaration. Because in verse 36, he says, And Mary, you might not know it, but your cousin Elizabeth. Remember your older cousin Elizabeth? You mean the one that's 85 years old? Yeah, that one. Your cousin Elizabeth. Why, she's expecting and she's already six months pregnant. Can you imagine? The text doesn't give Mary's response, but, I, but, but it's like Mary saying, no, you've got to be kidding. Elizabeth's expecting? Yeah. Who did that? God did that. And then he makes that great statement. In verse 37, he says this, for nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible. Although Gabriel was telling Mary, although what Gabriel was telling Mary was completely implausible from a human standpoint, with God, it was nothing. You see, God has a history of doing the impossible. If God could open the barren womb of Sarah like he did in the Old Testament, if God could open the barren womb of Elizabeth like he did in this chapter, it's nothing for God to make Mary pregnant without ever knowing a man. He is God. He can do the impossible. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that today? Well, when I was a teenager, we used to sing this song. Vicky, remember this. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Remember that? Nothing is impossible when you're trusting in his word, hearken to the voice of God to thee. Is there anything too hard for thee? Well, put your trust in God alone and depend upon his word for everything. Oh, everything. Yes, everything is possible with God. Do you believe that today? You see, Mary sat back and said, God, how can this happen? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And the angel says, with God, 
everything is possible. Now, now listen, I guarantee you that you're never going to receive an angelic message in which the angel is going to come and tell you that you are about to bear God's next son. That's not going to happen. But, but let me ask you today, what impossible task needs done in your life today? Would you think about that for just a second? What impossible task needs done in your life today? Something that you cannot do. Something that is beyond the realm of your ability. Something that is beyond the realm of anyone's ability. You would sit back and say, it's impossible, but God. If it weren't for God, it could never happen. Listen, my friend, God is the God of the impossible. And even though God doesn't always choose to demonstrate his power and accomplish the impossible in our lives, he certainly has the capability of doing that. Do you believe, do you believe that God can do the impossible in your life? For with God, everything is or is possible. Let me show you a third thing and we're done. The last thing is Mary's reaction. Mary's reaction, her faith is commendable. Notice, after having received the message from the angel, Mary simply responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. I read that and I'm shocked. There's no, hey, can you give me a couple days to think about this? (laughs) Would Would you mind if I consulted with my doctor? Because that makes no sense whatsoever. You know what, I'd like to go talk to Joseph about this. Would you give me a second? With unequivocal faith, Mary says, may it be done just as you say. Two things we see from that. If you remember in the passage, the first is this. Her faith is contrasted with that of Zechariah. Do you remember, we didn't spend a whole lot of time on it last week, but Zechariah was in the temple and the same angel Gabriel came and said, Zechariah, why, this time next year, your wife is going to have a son. Zechariah's response was one of unbelief. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Go back to verse 20 of chapter 1. Verse 20. Or, or verse 19, for context. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good, good news. Verse 20. But now, since you don't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Here was Zechariah, who was a lifelong priest. A man who ministered in the things of God. And when the angel came and gave Zechariah this miraculous message, Zechariah struggled with believing it. And so the angel says, just to prove that I'm right, you're not going to speak for the next nine months. And if you read the rest of the passage, and we'll study it in just a few weeks, for nine months, Zechariah didn't speak. And the first time in nine months that Zechariah speaks is after the baby's born. They ask him what the child's name, and he says this, his name will be John and his tongue was loosed and he spoke for the first time why did he not speak for nine months because he struggled with unbelief and yet here we find a 14 or 15 year old girl in an insignificant place called Nazareth and when the angel Gabriel comes to her and gives her this unbelievable message Her response is, I'm your servant. Do with me as you wish. Her faith is contrasted with that of Zechariah. But the second thing we see is her faith is lifted up as an example to us. If you jump down to verse 45, we'll be looking at this verse next week. Verse 45, the angel says this to Mary, you are blessed. Because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. What an example to us. So let me ask you today. Which one of the, of the characters in Luke 1 describes or characterizes your faith? This morning, do you have the faith of Zechariah? Or do you have the faith of Mary? Mary? 
Do you believe that God can use you? You see, once again, keep in mind the whole context of the book of Luke. We said in our first message that the purpose of Luke was to point people to Jesus. He's convincing Theophilus that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And the purpose was not to elevate Theophilus, not to elevate Luke, but to elevate Jesus and to demonstrate that Jesus is the very Son of God who came to transform lives. And our purpose is to point people to him. And here's the cool thing. Just as John was commissioned and Mary was chosen, you and I have been chosen and commissioned to do the exact same thing, to point people to Jesus Christ. And even though we're flawed, and even though we're not perfect, the neat thing is that God desires to use us. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe it? You see, with God, nothing is impossible.